interpretation to what they thought the original manuscript should say. Case in point, in the New Testament we know the New Testament for the most part was written in the Aramaic and the Greek. Many people hang their hat on all kinds of things that they read in the New Testament as gospel. And you've watched many ministers on television and heard them on radio proclaim certain things that are in the original text that are not there. For instance, they say Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. How many of you have heard that a million times? Jesus never made that statement. He never made that statement. He said, in my Father's universe, speaking in the Aramaic language, which was the everyday language of the people, in my Father's universe are many dwelling places. Now this kicks open a brand new door. It allows our imagination to soar. It imagines, uh, causes our imagination to, to expand, to embrace perhaps the thought that we are not alone in the universe. And I've heard from so many ministers, rabbis, and priests that have called me a false prophet because they said, if God placed life on any other planet, he would have told us. <laughs> By golly, it's been in the book for all these years, but they're just too lazy to read it in the original. You see? And they condemn, and they condemn, and they condemn. Their only message to mankind is hellfire and brimstone. Ladies and gentlemen, listen carefully. I believe man is sacred in the eyes of heaven. I do not believe in condemning the human race. They know how bad they are. They know how much they need help. Instead of hitting them on the head with a theological rod and telling them about hellfire and brimstone and hellfire, this is the only message ever taught by the Master Jesus? No, sir. The Master said, I am come to bring life, L-I-F-E, and that more abundantly. And the reason that so many churches are like mortuary centers today is it's, it's so cold in some churches you can skate down the aisle. <laughs> That's true. And if the members would get up and shake your hand when you come in or when you leave, it's, it's an accident. And if some of them smile at you, they're not really smiling. They've got a twitch in their mouth. The church, the temples, the synagogues, the religious centers of the world today are the coldest that I have ever seen. And I've been throughout the world. There are some, a small percentage of religious institutions where you come in, they'll shake your hand, tell, tell you they're glad to see you, they'll show you to your seat, they'll make you feel so comfortable that you feel like you've been on a journey and you've come home. And another discrepancy, and I, I hope I don't smash anybody's theology too badly today. Uh, if I'm going to be stepping on your feet, you better pull in your feet. You have it? Read it for me. Listen to this. This is in the book of Jeremiah, which was written several thousand years after the record of Genesis. Now listen to the flowery sentences and the words and the structure of the words and the structure of the sentences. Remember, I told you in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. Listen to these words. Jeremiah chapter 4. Verse 23, I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form, and void, and the heavens, and they had no light. No light. So at that original creation, there must have been light for the prophet Jeremiah, who was moved upon by the same spirit of truth to write his record. Listen. Verse 24, I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled, and all the hills moved lightly. Verse 25, I beheld, and lo, there was no man, and all the birds of the heaven were fled. All right, who in the world has the right or the authority to say there is no man? Man was destroyed. The birds, they were gone. 
There is no record in the King James Bible of a civilization existing before the second verse of Genesis. And yet this scripture that fits easily between the first and second verses tells us not only was there no man, but the birds were even gone. Read. Verse 26. I beheld, and lo, the fruitful place was a wilderness. What fruitful place? There was none recorded back there. Or could this be part of the scripture that some organized churches many hundreds, perhaps thousands of years ago, tried to do away with and tried to suppress because the common people, like you and me, would not understand it? And all the cities thereof were broken down. What cities? There's no record of cities. And yet Jeremiah says, look, I looked and I beheld the cities were torn down. Read. All the cities thereof were broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. Verse 27. For thus hath the Lord said, the whole land shall be desolate, yet will I not make a full end. Ah, uh, thank you. God for those last four words. He said, all right, the whole thing is kaput now, but I'm going to start again. The original uh, Hebrew in this particular instance, in the King James, it says, I will not make a full end. The original language states emphatically, I will not pronounce a period after this, just a comma, because even though we're not pronouncing a full end, we're going to start all over again. Between this scripture and the mystery of the civilization prior to the flood, in the first instance we had what was considered an earth, perfect in every respect. After Genesis, something happened, he created another earth, and he started all over again. That planet lasted without incident until Adam and Eve dropped the ball in the Garden of Eden, which incidentally the Garden of Eden is no longer on this planet. Someday if you invite me back, I'll tell you where it is. Almighty God, the Creator said, Adam and Eve, I told you, you could do anything, do anything you please, go any place you please, eat, drink, anything except for the tree of good, and, uh, of good and knowledge. Is that correct? Adam had such a brain. Jehovah took him for a walk one day, and he said, Adam, you see those little things going in the water? They're fish. Give them a name. All right. You see those things flitting around the air? They are birds. Give them a name. You see these? These are flowers. Name all these species. Give them all that. These are fruit. These are vegetables. Give them a name. You see those big animals over there, the smaller ones, give them a name. Old Bible tells us that everything that ever was named was named by Adam. What a capacity! Not less than 10% that we're using of our brain today. What a fantastic capacity this man must have possessed. Now, where did Adam come from? He didn't come from some molecular structure that accidentally was washed up on the sands of time and this little molecular structure uh, didn't like it too much on the warm sand so scooted right back in the water and swam around for 4.3 million years longer and then one day a big high wave came in and put that molecular structure so far inland that he just got tired. He just decided to sit there and grow two legs and two arms and pop one head. And before you thought man was walking around. No, sir. You see, in the beginning, like the book says, the Almighty said, let us make man. Who in the world was the us? Adamic man. Adamic man. Let us make man in our image, in our likeness. And the good book tells us he took dust from the sea, from the earth, formed that man in his image, in his likeness. He gave him arms, he gave him legs, he gave him an entire physical anatomy, but he was only still a lump of clay lying on the ground. And then the book says, the Almighty breathed into this individual the breath of life, and man became a living soul. In other words, a portion 
of the Almighty went into that man to cause him to become a, a life form. You see? With a fantastic brain. Now, I don't even hold that man comes from a monkey. 